Tomorrow Nerds, I am Cheyenne, and welcome to the LARP House. Why am I dressed like a fairy today? I don't know, I just am trying to enjoy being alive, okay. <laughs> After it was recently revealed by the Game of Thrones costume designers that they sometimes use cheap IKEA rugs to make some cloaks on the show, I had to try my own crafty hands and see if I could come up with a DIY for you guys. So after asking my professional leatherworking friends for some advice, we made a list, went to Ikea, and uh, here's how I did the thing. Okay, so the very first thing I'm going to talk about is the cheap wool option that I found. It is called Eco Wool. It is made out of 100% recycled plastic bottles. Uh, I know it looks like one sort of solid piece, but it's actually a bunch of individual tiny plasticky fibers, and it does look like wool close up. It's just a little bit thinner, but for the purposes of this tutorial, I am fine with that. It is maybe like four to six dollars a yard, and I only needed about three yards of it to make a gathered cape for myself, because I am not big. I also picked up two yards of this braided belt, this knotted belt fabric for the straps that go across the chest on the Game of Thrones style cloaks. The thick straps really help distribute the weight evenly. It makes it a lot more comfortable than just a cord. But here I have a cord anyway and I have about three yards of that and I will show you why momentarily. The type of needles that you will need for this project are called repair needles. They are really sharp, they're heavy duty, they come with a set of curved needles. It's perfect for this project where we are working with heavier fabrics, braided cord, and really soft leather. And the type of thread that I use for this project, and pretty much all LARP projects if I can get away with it, is called upholstery thread. It is like normal thread on steroids. It's really strong, it's what they use to obviously sew upholstery and curtains and things like that. You could probably choke a man to death with just this thread. Don't... Don't quote me at that. You can get it at any fabric store, really. Sweet beans! This is... This is really... This is long. I have cut a square of this fabric that is as wide as my arm span and as tall as my shoulders from the floor because I'm just making a really simple gathered cape because I might be fighting in this cloak so I don't want the cloak to be so full that it gets in the way of my arms. If you want your cloak to be more like the ones on the show, here's a really handy chart made by Alice in Cosplayland, who I follow on Facebook. Thank you very much for this image. I made a cape more this shape. The ones on the show are more like this. So you can use this image as a reference if you're making a pattern for your own Game of Thrones cloak. So in order to make my gathered cape portion of this cloak, I have just laid my wool out on the floor and I'm laying that long cord, the thin one that I got on the very edge of it, or about an inch and a half, maybe two inches away from the edge of it. I am then folding the fabric over the cord, pinning it pretty far away so that I don't actually pin the cord at any point. I'm just pinning the fabric to itself. And I just continue to do this for the length of the top edge of my cape, the edge that will actually be going around my shoulders. And next, it's just a matter of sewing up what I've pinned. So I always use that method for sewing where you thread the needle and then rather than cutting it and leaving like a trail off of one side of the needle, I just bring the thread all the way back around and tie it so it's like the needle is in the middle of a loop. I have no idea what that method's called just because I've been doing it for as, as long as I've been sewing. But uh, I just tie it off at the end by like rolling it between my fingers and uh, I'm ready to go and the thread is double strength so I have never really seen a need to do it another way. And then I just straight stitch it. Just be really careful not to accidentally sew the cord in place because we're gonna scrunch up this whole deal in a minute here to make the gathery cape effect. And yes, you can run this through a sewing machine, you know, if you wanna save yourself some time, but I tend to put off being on a sewing machine for as long as possible because that means that it's real and it's happening and I'm forcing myself to sew. <laughs> and I figured that not every nerd has a sewing machine, so just showing you what's what. After I wrap that up, it's time for one of the most satisfying parts of this entire process. It's uh, scrunching up the cape so that it's gathered around the neck area. This is why it's important not to accidentally sew the cord to the fabric or your pants. <laughs> 
And then just pin the fabric on the cord where it stops so that you don't lose your desired amount of scrunchiness when you take it off of your body. The step after this is to sew the straps onto the cloak, just a little bit overlapping the front edge. This whole thing is going to be covered by fur anyway, so it doesn't matter much. The first thing you have to do though to be able to sew this stuff is to hot glue it, like you see me doing here. Keep the tape on and hot glue just the very, very top. That, uh, that keeps it from fraying while you're hot gluing. It makes you have to use a whole lot less hot glue. And then you can just take the tape off and it's sort of a perfect edge. Once that's done, I'm gonna get the sewing started by sewing the cords in place where we pinned them just a moment ago. And then using rather large X-shaped stitches, I'm gonna sew that big old strap in place on the very edge of the cloak. And once again, for the sake of durability, I have decided to go along the length of the strap and just sew the cord to the top of it as it's coming out of the scrunchening edge of the cloak. I don't, I don't know what I'm saying anymore. It's really late. But this means like I could have cut that little cord, but there's a chance it would have frayed and just ruined the whole cape eventually. So I'm just sewing it along the entire length. And that leaves me with a little tail end at the end of the straps of just the really thin cord so that you can wrap it around your chest and tie it in the back or in the front like these cloaks are meant to be worn. And once this is all done, we can move on from the actual cape making part and uh, to the fur. First things first, in Ikea, there are really, really cheap synthetic sheepskin and then there's the really real sheepskin. That's the stuff we're gonna be working with in this video. It is only 25 American dollars at Ikea and so soft. Starting off by slowly filling a tub that has a lid with some hot water, about as hot as is safe. <laughs> What's the matter, kid? <laughs> After deeply offending my cat somehow, just uh, dumping the sheepskins, I bought two of them, into the warm, very warm water. And just really making sure that water gets in all of the, all of the furs as much as possible. Or I should say, fleece? That's what you call sheep fur? I don't know. But um, adding a little bit more water, just to make sure. And then I filled up two of these jugs and put them in on top just to weigh it down, make sure it's really submerged. And I left it soaking for at least eight hours. You could leave it in there for 24 hours just to be sure that it is saturated with water. This creates a more even dye job. And I've got the next bucket that I'm using for the actual dye bath. I'm filling it up with hot water again, as hot as is safe. And I've got my Rit dye and my vinyl gloves on my hands and a spatula that I do not care about and will never again use for food. Um, I've got as much water in the in the tub as per my dye instructions. Um, I've just planned on using the entire bottle, so however much water the entire bottle or the entire contents of your dye calls for, go ahead and use that, because this sheepskin is real, real thick <laughs> and requires a lot of water to be fully submerged. And I've put the dye bath right next to the original like soaking bin because this sheepskin is super fragile when it's soaking wet like that. So I just tried to ball it up as much as possible before transferring it because it's also super heavy and I felt like it would just tear from its own weight if I had picked it up by just one piece of it. And after that, I'm really just kneading it uh, around to make sure that the dye comes in contact with as much fur as possible because the fleece, the wool, the, it's not wool yet, the fleece is so incredibly thick that you could leave these skins soaking in the dye bath for like a full day and it would still miss some fur probably if you don't manually spread it around because it's just, it's just that thick and soft and wonderful. There's another step before I leave them to totally soak. I'm only leaving it for a moment, but I always put the lid on because I have cats. Uh, that's why I love using these tubs for dye baths. 
But the next step is how you sort of help the die set. So I am going to get out my salt and a measuring cup and measure out a full cup of salt into a jug of some, again, pretty hot water. Then I'm going to shake it around to help it dissolve, and that way the salt will spread as evenly as possible into the dye bath. And once I make it back to the dye bath, you just sort of dump it in. And again, you want to wait like 10-15 minutes. And then uh, stir it around like a like a soup made from the swamps of sadness in the never-ending story. That's what this looks like to me. Artax! Oh no, I made myself sad. Anyway, once that's all stirred up, I'm gonna close up shop and leave it to soak overnight, at least. 24 hours if you can. A new day, a fresh bucket. <laughs> I've got the other bucket here because I'm going to scoop the sheepskins out of the dye bath into this bucket for transport outside for rinsing time. One thing I didn't expect, but definitely should have in, in hindsight, uh, when you leave sheepskin to soak overnight in water, it smells like sheep, and uh, not in a cute way. <laughs> and here I just brought it outside and rinsed until the water ran clear, you know, like a dog. And, uh, once I had finished rinsing them, it was apparent that they were purple. Rit. Black. Cloth dye. Turns. Things. Just. Dark. Purple. So, I did everything again with a new dye that I am going to put in the corner of the screen and have a link to in the bottom corner. Did the whole process again and, uh, ended up looking considerably less purple. This is way more black. Wonderful. Very nice watch. I set them up with two fans on them for a couple of days because you do not want to leave these out in the sun while they dry. And once they were dry, they were a bit stiff, so I brushed them out with one of those hair brushes with a million teeny little teeth, like whale teeth. I don't know, I don't know what to call that. Once I brushed it back to relative softness, this is a sprayable white fabric paint that I've just sprayed a little into my hands and I'm starting to frost the tips of these black sheepskins like the hair of a 90s boy band member. Mm -hmm. What this accomplishes eventually, as you'll see here, is adding some visual texture, adding some sort of distressed weathering, you know, maybe some age to the animal. I don't, I don't know. Frosting it, looking a little more northern. It's never, never a bad thing. All in all, varying your color a little bit within your fur is going to make it look more realistic. And on that note, I have tried to make it a little frostier on the edges and on the outside and a little darker in the center. And then just brushing it out again in case the paint caused any clumps that I don't want. The next step here is going to be the treatment of the hide of the sheepskin because it does get stiff after rinsing it in water. This causes it to be waterproof and soft, and this is mink oil paste, which pretty much accomplishes that. I am heating the leather up a bit with a hair dryer just so it absorbs the mink oil a little bit better. And little bit by little bit, I'm just dipping my hand into the tub of mink oil paste and working in small areas at a time and just really, really working it in there. <laughs> I don't know, just, it's like giving a dead animal a massage. It's not that weird. And don't worry, if you are actually going to follow along and do this, the links to everything that I use will be in the description of this video. If the links happen to be Amazon links, using those links helps us out at no additional cost to you. There, I have plugged the thing. God, let's talk about anything else on the planet. Once that mink oil is nice and evenly applied, allow these to air dry overnight. Now I have got a fresh new razor blade that you can get at hardware stores in like packs of a hundred, and we're going to use this to cut out the pattern as per the official IKEA 
Game of Thrones cloak instructions. <laughs> the only thing I am really changing about the IKEA instructions, because the pattern itself is fine, I am using a razor blade on the back of the hide. That's how I have learned from friends. That's how you are always supposed to cut fur. You lose virtually zero fur as opposed to losing however much fur the giant clumsy scissors catch in their destructive wake. Once that's all cut out, the next step is to put on the cape from before, put this on top of it, and pin it so that the placement is how you like it. This feels cool. <laughs> I must defend the no. <laughs> you know nothing, Jon Snow. The white walkers. Yeah, so. Moving on. I am using the smaller straight needle to sew the sheepskin where I've pinned it in just three sort of anchor spots. The thing about this is that it seems to not like its integrity compromise, meaning. A couple of big holes where you sew through multiple times is better than many, many little holes because that will just cause it to rip like a perforated edge. And because I had the other sheepskin anyway and the back looked a little bit bare, I took it upon myself to just sew the sheepskins together in a couple anchor points. Like I said, just as few holes as possible. But let me tell you, I'm pretty sure that 98% of my stress dreams from here on out in my life are going to be me trying to sew slightly hardened sheepskin with mink oil all over my fingers. <laughs> let that be a warning to you. The final step in this process is going to be distressing this fake wool so it looks a little less fake. What I'm holding is a rasp. It's basically a small sharp cheese grater on a stick. You can get it at most hardware stores. It's wonderful for distressing fabric. It's also sometimes referred to as dragon skin. Now, the cool thing about wool and materials like it is that you don't have to hem the edges, but distressing it makes it look a lot more organic, a lot more natural, because as you can see, the manicured, perfectly cut out edges, they look a little bit like children's felt shapes, so we want to avoid that. But that's the, that's the last step. You are prepared for winter. That is a thing you know, and I would like now to take this time to introduce you to the person who gave me advice necessary to make this video and the featured LARPer of this episode, Kia Hinton of Black Griffin Designs. So Kia is a one-woman powerhouse of artistic skill. She makes leathery props and goods for film, TV, and she has worked with Walt Disney Imagineering. Like, you guys, she has made props that are on Disney rides at this moment. And there's another secret ride in the works. Well, not secret, she just can't talk about it yet. And um, I'm just so excited. And I'm having one of those moments, I'm sorry, where you realize that your friends are also kind of your heroes. And how am I so lucky to exist on the same planet at the same time as these people? And I'm just... Go, uh, go check her out at blackgriffindesigns.com or her Instagram, which is also blackgriffindesigns. It's beautiful. It's beautiful work. It's beautiful work. And her artistic skill is almost as perfect as her face. And with that, we're done for this week, nerds. Thank you so much for watching. We love you, we cherish you, and if you have any questions, comments, or emotional outbursts, please feel free to message us. We're on Twitter, Tumblr, Facebook, and Instagram. The links to all these, plus the LARP House email for business inquiries is in the description of this video. And don't forget, if you have a character concept that you would like to see me do an entire makeup tutorial based on, pitch the idea to me using the hashtag LHShowMe on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. And I may pick yours, and I'll then I'll do a whole video of it, like, like I did here for this one. So thank you again for watching, and as always, nerds, like us, subscribe to us, but most importantly, fight with us. So those are some things you know now, and I would like to. Oh my god, what? <gasps> Rufio, what? Why, babe? Oh. Are you surprised? Really? Hi, 
Hi there, in case there was any doubt in your mind, I am in no way associated with IKEA, HBO, or Game of Thrones. Uh, George R. R. Martin won't even retweet me, so... You know. 